Amen. 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 Let's jump into this new series. I'm excited about it. Uh, influence. When we look at this thing, if you look, took a survey on what defines discipleship, even with the audience that is here listening to the word in person or even those online, if we took a survey on what it means to be a disciple, the answer could vary. Some would say being a disciple is about benevolence, and so it's about tending to the needs of those who are less fortunate. And true, that is an a, a indicator of discipleship. Why? Wow, because God focused his ministry on those who were less fortunate, those who were poor. Amen? Some would say discipleship is about uh, worship, and, and certainly it is about discipleship because, God, as we said earlier, God is not about uh, needing our praise, but God deserves it. Someone else might say that worship is about my tithes and offerings and how I should give to God because I consider all that God has given to me. And surely that is a component of discipleship. Um, but while our responses might vary, our responses may be complex, uh, Christ keeps it simple here in John chapter number 13. While he could give a litany, a laundry list of things uh, that make up a disciple, Christ knows that you and I have a hard time with simplicity. He knows that he can ask one question and everybody's going to say something different, right? And so Christ, instead of asking us what is discipleship to us, he comes out and tells us what discipleship is all about. Amen. It makes sense. And so it starts with the fundamental concept of discipleship. One, we follow God. Again, discipleship means to follow God. Why is that important? Because sometimes if we're not careful, we can have the misconstrued perception that God follows us. God doesn't follow us. We're called to follow him. See, if you're not careful, you think, okay, God has to follow me. God has to answer all my prayers. God follows after me and takes, and surely God does take care of us. But as a disciple, God is not a follower of us. But we're called to be followers of him. That makes sense? And so it's simple uh, 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 and fundamental is that we follow God. That deals with the entirety of your life, your very being, you follow God while you're at worship corporately. You follow God in your private time at home. We follow God on, in the office when you're on the job, in your place of employment. Every facet of your life is a facet or a component of discipleship. Okay? That's number one. And so as we look at this thing, uh, in the secular realm, John C. Maxwell he wrote a book, uh, one of my favorite books. Um, it's called The Five Levels of Leadership. And he defines leadership in one word, and that's called influence, right? So he just says, if an individual has the ability to influence, be it negative or positive, that individual has the ability to lead. See, we all think uh, leadership is about your position, and that's one layer to it. But at its core is at the end of the day, do you have the ability to influence people? And so he says, if you can influence people, then you have the ability to lead. Right? Now, uh, uh, if you look at this thing, and then you go back to the title of this lesson and, and, and the graphic there, in order to influence people, you have to be involved with people. Many of us want to have influence but don't want to be involved, all right? And so influencing others for Christ should be our primary goal as disciples. In every uh, facet of your life, you have to ask the question, how can I influence others for the cause of Christ? And it's not just by your ability to know Scripture. It's by your ability and how you live your daily life, how you talk to people, how you carry yourself, your body language, the kind of aura that you, uh, uh, that you put off. All of that is involved with influencing others for God. That makes sense? 
And so in this profound dialogue with the 12, Christ emphasizes the following. I've got two points that I offer to us that are going to help us uh, understand this fundamental uh, clause of discipleship. Number one, according to verse 34, we see the point of command. Somebody say command. command. One more time, command. command. You're with us on a lot of taking notes right down that word, command. Right here in the text in verse 34, the Bible says here, a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you that you also what? Love one another. Is that in your Bibles? Let's look at this thing here. Uh, appreciation for this is seen in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse number 5. Now, you understand that Christ, his life was a fulfillment of Old Testament scripture. You'll see that in the book of Luke, when, Luke, when Christ had the conversation with the lawyer, and one of the things he asked was, uh, you know, uh, what must one do to inherit eternal life, right? He said, what, you shall love the Lord your God in so many ways, with all your mind, with all your heart, with all your body, with all your soul, right? And so Christ here in, uh, in, in John chapter number 13 gives a parallel, or this is a callback or a reference to Old Testament scripture. Why? Because as long as Christ was alive, the Old Testament was still in effect. Okay? And, and, and so when you get down to verse number 34 again, he, this is a few chapters before he's getting ready to offer himself as atonement for the sins of the world. And so before he does this atonement, he has to give some instruction to the disciples that remain. Now keep in mind, this is important contextually because prior to our reading in verse number 31, there were a couple of events that took place that shook the core of the disciples. Number one, you'll see at the beginning of John chapter number 13, you'll see that Christ offers servitude by washing the disciples' feet. Now you'll see there, this was showing even though Christ is the Son of God, he's the great I am, he's a part of the Holy Trinity, he's a part of the Godhead, but the Master showed humility by serving his disciples. And that's a major part of discipleship is can you think about somebody else before yourself? Christ thought about, even though, even though he was getting ready to die, Christ wanted to model discipleship before he left this world. Right? So that's the first part of John chapter 13. Then you get down to verse number 18 of the text. After uh, uh, Jesus washes their feet, and that includes Judas. Again, 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 the very one that would soon betray the Lord, Jesus washed his feet. And so he models what he said way back in the Beatitudes where he says what? Pray for your enemies. Right? Love your enemies and pray for those who despitefully misuse you, right? And so Christ modeled that by washing the one that he knew had his hand against him. After he washed his feet, then in verse 18, he identified his betrayer. He said, one of you is going to betray me. And so between Christ in verses 1 to 17, washing their feet, and then in verse 18 to verse number 30, identifying who would betray him, these were very troubling circumstances. But then after these troubling circumstances, Christ now gives meaning to these events here in verse 34. He says that this is because a new commandment I give to you. Again, this old callback to Deuteronomy chapter 6 was a, 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 a fundamental statement that was offered in the Pentateuch in the first five books of the Bible. And so what we see in verse 34, it mirrors Deuteronomy chapter number Six, y'all still with me? I'll be where I need to be in a minute, but I want to make sure that we have a foundation on what Christ is doing here, right? So Christ, he is fulfilling the law by also giving a new law. Okay? What's important, preacher? I want to understand that that term command in verse 34, when he said, a, what a new command I give 
to you. That term command in the original language defines as an ordinance or an injunction. This is as serious as a law that is passed via the court of law, right? And so this command that we see or this utterance, this injunction that we see, it is as serious as a bill of law that is passed in government. Preacher, why are you putting it this way? It's because oftentimes the challenge that Christ is teaching us here is to view this text as a command and not optional. Oftentimes in the body of Christ, we view loving our fellow brother or sister as optional. But Christ is saying, how I expect you to treat your fellow brother or sister, that is not optional. It's a command. And so it's not up for debate. It's not up for deliberation. Christ said from the before I tell you what I'm going to tell you, understand the foundation is the command. In other words, what Christ is saying off the top, uh, when you talk about this command of love, right, number one, you have to love with a different standard. I'm going to come back to that in a minute. But I, I, I want to push the term command because it's not obligation. It's not optional. It's not coincidental. It's not a possibility. It's not if you got time in your calendar. No, this thing is a command. Ooh, y'all quiet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When committed, the process, when we're committed to being disciples, right, this whole this thing about disciples, when we're committed to being disciples, we understand this process of love becomes non-negotiable. Meaning it's not an option. It's not anything to debate about. <laughs> Let's move forward. Christ calls for the disciples to consider more than love in this new command. Preach, what are you getting at? In verse 34, he said, a new commandment that I give to you is that you love one another. So far, that's in alignment with Old Testament scripture. But here is where Christ, he says, he says, a new commandment that I give to you that you love one another as I have loved. I'm going to read it again because that was only about five of y'all reading your Bibles. Christ said, a new commandment that I give to you that you love one another. That's in alignment with Deuteronomy 6. But then here's where he changes it. He says that you love one another as I have loved you. So Christ teaches that uh, 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 there is a type. And there is a standard of love that separates Old Testament in the Pentateuch from New Testament here in John chapter number 13. In the Old Testament, the standard of love was self. Some of y'all missed it. What does this say? What? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with your soul, with your mind, right? 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 And then love your neighbor as you love yourself. But in the Old Testament, the standard of love is self. So based on my ability to love, that is the limit or capacity to how I'm called to love you. But Christ understanding the limitations and the frailty of our minds and how we love to read between the lines and try to find a way. Y'all know how we are. Christ said, well, you know, he understands, well, you know, if it's just about self, then well, this is, you, you can say to somebody else, well, I love you based on my ability. This is all that I personally have to give to you. The reason why I talk to you the way I do is because this is the only way that I know how to love, right? Because the standard of love based on Old Testament is self. And so you can limit love based on the individual. So I talk to you the way I want to talk to you. Why? Because that's, this is why you can say that's, that's, that's how I, this is who I am. I can look at you the way I look at you. Why? Because I'm the standard. Ooh, y'all quiet and I like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. 
I can treat you any old kind of way. Why? Because according to Old Testament, it's based on my ability. But in the New Testament, Christ said, I, I don't want you just to love one another, but let me elevate. Let me raise the stakes. He said, love one another as not based on how you love or how you choose, but you need to love one another based on me, based on how I love, based on how I treat you, based on how, my, based on my ability. So in other words, now, I, I got to be careful how I talk to you, Brother Nate. Why? Because I got to exercise godly love. I got to be careful how I look at you to make sure I ain't rolling my eyes or turning my nose up at you or looking down on you. Why? Because that's not the standard. That's not how God loves. Right? Now, let's be clear. Christ, he's talking to the disciples. Right? There's another conversation for how we treat the world. But God is not concerned about how we treat the world. God is concerned with how we treat. Because what happens in family, sometimes in family, and I've seen it in my own life, I've seen it within my own family, you know, where people say, man, you know, I feel more love out in the world than I do the, own, do the church. And Christ said, before I die, before I get out of here, before, but, but before I take my plane on up to glory, I want to make sure that there's a better standard in play. Because I'm getting ready to leave, and God understands. He's like a parent. As long as I'm around, y'all going to act right. But it's when I'm gone, when I'm not in your presence, that you feel like you can do what you want. And so God is setting the record straight before I give my life, before I shed my blood, before I return to glory from which I came. Here's a standard that you love one another, not based on you, but how I have loved you. And so he sets a new standard. What's the point? The question is on the floor of this first point. As a disciple, are you self-willed or are you God-willed? As a follower of God, am I following according to the will of God or am I following according with what I really want to do? Mm -hmm. It's not about your will. It's like the old prayer, the model prayer in Matthew 6. God, you know, let thy will be done. Christ moderated it again in the Garden of Gethsemane. Lord, but not my will, but let your will be done, right? And so there are times when the will that we have of the flesh and our own desires, it's going to try to get in the way of God's will, and we have to have internal spiritual fortitude to say, you know what, not my will, but your will. And what is the will of God in this particular context that we love with godly love? I know it's challenging, but this is what influence is all about, okay? And so we not only see the command, but then we see there's a great cause, according to verse 35. Somebody say cause. cause. Second point that we see, according to verse 35, is the cause. Look at the text in verse 35. The Bible says here, by this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Is that in your Bibles? You move forward and you say, you say, well, Christ, uh, you know, normally when I look at humanity, we are given the option of free will. We're the only creation that God made where we possess the ability to make choices, right? And, and so, God, why, why command? God, why are you so adamant? Shouldn't I have a choice in the matter? You know, if, if I've had free will up until this point to make choices to do good or to do evil as a disciple, I feel like I, I should have a choice in the matter, right? And, and so Christ, why, why is Christ in this text, why is he so adamant? Why is verse 34 given as a command instead of being optional? Understand that this type of love that God commands, it is unique to humanity. 
Why? Because again, the prior form of love was based on self. And the love that we have of self is subjective. One day, if life is going well and your love is circumstantial and life is going well, then guess what? Your love is elevated. But if, if, if your love is based on circumstance and how you're feeling and how things are going in your life, then your love is going to fluctuate. God is saying, the reason why I make it a command and not optional or something that is a matter of free will is because I want this standard, I want this level of consistency to level across the board. The reason why this is a command this form, this, this magnitude of love is because this form of love is literally, according to God, the great identifier of Christian discipleship. And so it's not about our acts of benevolence or our giving or our worship to God. And, 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 and these are all great and fine and dandy. But at the core, Christ is saying the moniker, the label, the great identifier of what separates my followers from people who follow someone else is my love. Some of y'all flew over your head. Lord. What God is teaching here in verse 35 is that when God's love is absent, we are literally unidentifiable from the world. When you don't love with this godly standard, God is saying the world cannot separate you from them. And so the question on the floor, and I'm really trying to get up and close and personal with you. Again, this is all in the context of how we treat each. And it's not limited to how we treat each other in this building. Why? Because verse 35 says, for by this will all men know. Men will be able to identify you from the world based on your life. It's not based on your worship. Because anybody can worship God. Anybody can sing. Anybody can pray. Anybody can put some money in the collection. Anybody can drink uh, the, the juice and the cracker. But the great identifier, the great label, the great stamp or the great seal that identifies us is our ability to implement and exercise godly love. In other words, godly character. That's how I talk to you. That's how I act toward you. That's how I treat you. In other words, Christ ensures with this command that the only way that we stand out is by showcasing God. <laughs> Christ, in other words, he's reminding us through his life and through this word here that as a disciple, your life is not about you anymore. It's not about how you feel. It's not about what you believe, but it's about what is. Because beliefs can come and they can go. But Christ is saying, it's not about what you think or how you feel. It's about what I say. Because oftentimes in the body, why we can't grow, why there's no fellowship, why we don't come together, why we don't thrive, is because we're in the way. Because we limit discipleship to how much Bible I know. We limit discipleship to how well I can sing. We limit discipleship to my attendance record in worship and Bible class. We limit discipleship on how well I dress. We limit discipleship to how much money I put in the plate. We have these standards that God never put in place. 
And God said, what, what separates you from everybody else is not how loud you sing or how earnestly you pray. But what sets you apart is when people look at you, do they see you or do they see God? And the time is now to take careful inventory of self and look at our relationships within the body and ask, do I look like God? Mm -hmm. This is right. I love what Christ is doing here because he's saying the question of do I look like God, that question is not just for the world, but more importantly, it's for each other. Now, y'all be real with me. You know how it is. And nobody knows you like your family. So, you know, the world who don't see you all the time, you can fool them. But the people who you worship with, who you sit in the pews with, who you talk to and interact, I'm be real honest with y'all now, I hear about the conversation that's going on in the church. Mm-hmm. You think don't nobody hears it, and it's not even about me, but it's about God? Mm-hmm. God is observing our relationships. One thing I love about my relationship with Sister Rise, we always talk about our kingdom relationships. Sister Rise, we talk about it all the time. It's good to have what? Kingdom relationships, right? And, and I love having relationships in the world, in the community, but, but what I love most is the relationships that I have with my spiritual family. And as the minister of the church, as the manager of the Lord's church, one of my jobs is to observe the relationships that go on in the body. And sometimes we don't always love with God's standard. Is that all right? Moving forward. In addition to this great cause, Christ offered the dynamic clause. Write this down. This is important. If the love of God is absent within us, Jesus is declaring that we're not his disciples. He's saying, again, again, this standard of love is not optional. Remember, it's a command, right? And so based on this command and our willingness, this is where free will comes in, right? Our will, even though it's a command, we still have the will to decide, to choose how I treat my fellow brother or sister, how I carry myself, how I interact, someone speaks to me, how I, inter- how I respond to them. I don't, I don't expect a lot of amens in this thing. This thing is holding us accountable. It's holding me accountable. It's holding every single one of us individually. It's holding us all accountable. And so again, I'm going to read it to you again. If the love of God is absent, Jesus is declaring through this context, you don't belong to him. That's why Christ said back in Matthew, many, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, but they don't mean they're going to inherit. Many people are singing, but they may not inherit. Many people are praying, but that don't mean they're going to inherit. Some of the greatest givers in the church have awful relationships. Some of the people that show up to worship every Sunday are corrupt on the inside. Again, I had to check me before I talked to y'all this morning, right? I said I had to make sure God as an individual, not, not the preacher, God as your child. Do I model you? Can people see you when they look at Ryan? And these are real questions that you have to ask yourself. And you have to deal with the real response when you ask not just yourself, but when you, when you compare your life to the good book of God's word. What's the point, preacher? I'm going to leave y'all off. 
Again, who does the world see when they look at you? Do they see you? Or do they see God? I'm not here to mince words. I'm being very intentional over these next two years. Because I believe with all my heart that all of us can afford to grow as disciples. Starting with me. All of us have room to improve. No one's perfect. That should be obvious. But the reality is we don't always act that way. Some of us act like we actually are. And the reality is there's room for us all to grow. Reality is God being flesh and man simultaneously, there was room in the flesh for him to grow. He say, Jesus, yeah. Look at him in the garden. He was contemplating on, do I want to move forward with this? I mean, this is Christ talking. And even Christ had, we see, he had a strong connection with his father. And so when the flesh was weak and trying to abort his purpose, to abort the mission, God allowed the Holy Spirit to step in where the flesh wanted to drop out. And he modeled even then what it means to be a disciple. It means that there are times in your life as God's child, as a follower of him, where you're not going to always want to follow God. But you have to make the conscious decision to be honest with self. When I'm honest in my flesh, I really don't want to do this thing. But because God is not following me, but I follow him, I'm going to sacrifice. I'm going to be more patient. I'm going to be more long-suffering. I'm going to be more kind. We forget about kindness sometimes. I'm going to be more kind. Right? Even though I may be annoyed, something may have happened in my life that's on my heart, that's, that's vexing me, that's annoying me, that I'm agitated about. But even though that's going, I'm going to be mindful that what's going on with me, that's not her problem. He didn't do it to me, and I'm not going to project it or take it out. Oh, I know I'm in somebody's street, and that's okay. But this is what real disciple, this is what it means to influence. Because God is saying you can't influence the world if you can't even influence your own family. How can you preach the gospel if you can't even tell it to your family? How can you model behavior of God out in the world when the people who you hear with every Sunday don't even see it? We sing, oh, how I love Jesus, but do, do you live it? I like that. You don't live it, you don't love it. I like that. Come on up here and preach, man. You got it? <laughs> That's good, man. You don't live it, you don't love it. Okay. And so this, it's going to be hard. It's going to be a hard two years, y'all. I've been praying about it for a couple years. But this is where we are. Growing is not always comfortable. Developing is not always fun, but it's necessary. Okay? People say, oh, I pray I want to be, I want to grow in this area, I want to grow in that. Do you understand what growing requires? Well, growing requires a little pain, a little discomfort, but it's necessary and vital to our growth and our salvation. Come on your feet. As we get here to this point of invitation, Spirit of God has put in my heart right now. Right now, I want us all to focus on our relationships with each other in the church. That's all I want you to focus on. We'll deal with the world at another time, but right now, I want us to deal with, with, with us, okay? How are your relationships with, you, with the body of Christ? Because God said elsewhere in Scripture, how we treat each other is a reflection on how we treat God. 
So God said, if you, can't, if you can't love those that you can see, how can you love me who you've never seen? And so as we're standing and we're meditating on this word, on our ability to influence, our ability to model discipleship with how we love. If you're here and there is a variance in your relationships, let's pray about it. I know this lesson was uncomfortable. It was uncomfortable for me. But that's why God gives grace. And that's why God gives us the avenue of prayer. Because if we're all standing, we're all here because we need the prayers of the righteous. We stand in the need of prayer. We need God to give us grace. We need God to restore us. We need God to put us back where we need to be. Okay? Right? And so if you're here, as a member of the Lord's Church, and you say, you know what, I can afford to be better with my, how I treat my fellow brother or sister. I can grow. Let's pray about it. Why? Because there are people who come in from the world who may not be members, who sit next to us, who are in these same pews, and they're also watching. They're watching how the spiritual family treats each other. And they're meditating on if they want to follow God based on what they see when they come here. The ability for someone to say yes to God is ultimately an act of God's grace, but practically it's heavily influenced by what they see in here. If they don't see God's love, if they don't feel it, the question is, well, why should I follow God if this is, what, this is the kind of behavior that I see? Why should I follow God if I know when I'm converted, this is how I'm going to be treated? Why should, why should I be a part of Virgin Street when I don't see love in the congregation. And I, I'm just speaking generally now, right? But these are the questions that people in the world ask when it comes to, number one, being converted to God. Why? Because God is seen and shown through his children. Okay? You need prayer, this is your time. Not a member of the body of Christ. Maybe you're asking a question. I want to follow God, but I'm considering the people of God. Understand there's a time and a place for that, but right now I want you to focus on God. Focus on the truth of God's word. Focus on, number one, your relationship with him. Because when you focus on your relationship with him, the relationships with us, they all fall in place. And so that's a reminder not just to the soul that wants to be converted, but also the soul that should be converted. The soul that's already been baptized. Focus on your relationship with God. And that relationship will naturally affect your relationships with the family. Make sense? So if you're not a member, you're focusing on that relationship with God. You say, man, I consider that grace and that love, that servitude that we saw in the text and how God served us all by leaving heaven and dying, shedding his blood so that we could live. What's the natural response to God? Man, okay, what should I, what, 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 what can I do? God, I see what you've done, but what, what can I do at this point? There's something that, that I should be doing in response to all that you've done. Just as Christ died, you're called to die as well. God is not asking for you to shed your blood, but he's asking for you to give your life. Come to the grave of baptism with a repenting spirit, understanding that I'm coming to God as I am. There's some things, there's some ways, there's some tendencies that I have that God is not pleased with. And God, I know I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to give you my best, and I'm going to give you my all to the best of my ability. That's your desire. You can be saved. Put God on in baptism. Put you in his family. Put you in his church. And it gives you a spiritual family to support you and love you 
and encourage you through the good times and through the bad times. Remember the body need prayer? Want to be converted in salvation? This is your time. Come on now while we sing a song of invitation. Will you come?